two, one. Well, here we are. The Back end, in the saddle. The end of April. Welcome to West Point, Mississippi, everybody. Yeah. Red eyes. Everybody's tired. Yeah. Wind, things are winding down a little bit. Uh, it, it, and we've got a uh, Rob. Yeah, it was here. good to see. It was good to see Rob. It's been a while. Hey, been Rob. out for a little bit on the road. He has been slaving it. So you know, Rob was supposed to meet me one morning to film a turkey hunt, and I, got I heard a, I got a text saying I overslept. <laughs> <laughs> overslept. <laughs> really? Yeah, I've I've got a sleeping issue where every now and then I just won't wake up till a lot later than I'm supposed he, to. He, asked, did, he was in there explaining to me what happened. I was like, oh man, it happens, and he's like, you know, I, have you ever just accidentally slept till one p.m.? And I said. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Listen, I, I, in my in my job interview, I said, "Listen, this is going to happen. You can ask Spence." Yeah, he I said it to me. <laughs> I slept through a hunt that I was supposed to do with Maddie, and anyway, it happens. I bet you, you didn't sleep through Tom Kelly, though, did you? No, but oh, I yeah. also slept on a couch, so I'd wake up when everybody else did. Let's officially start this, guys. We're we're all excited. Um, glad to have Dudley raced home. Ra- yeah, raced I thought you were back. at a show, man. Well, I got up like an adult at about 6 o'clock this morning. And drove and home. Ate a continental breakfast and hit the road. He's a yeah. warrior. Went to Tennessee, but he didn't go turkey hunt. Ooh. No, I went to the Ryman. That was good. I mean, that's good. That's good. What did you go see? A jazz fusion band called Snarky Puppy. Ooh. Were what they is, snarky? What is fusion. Fusion. You know what fusion Just, is. I don't care. Let's just move on. I'm, I'm not even remotely interested in that. Okay. Uh, oh, that's, okay. I can I understand. Some why. of the listeners might be. I doubt any of our <laughs> listeners. I, I'm saving us, Lanny. I'm saving us. I don't think any of our listeners would, would – if they are, they can communicate directly with Dudley. Yeah. So. Well, sorry I distracted us from the, the, you know, the yeah. conversation. So let's talk about a, blood on the biological. Let's talk about it's it. brought to you by LS Tractors. Hey, our We buddies. love LS Tractors. So uh, – that, there's been a bunch of blood on the biologic, yeah. but we started off. Tom, I, can you believe it? How old Look, is Tom Kelly? We had him in camp last year. Um, you know, this is he's obviously a an icon in the turkey world, but I'm not. I, Ron, tell us what happened. Yeah, well, I don't want to tell all this story yet because I, I think Daniel needs to be here. We need to get Keith Ott also on the podcast for that as well. But yeah. the, the long story short is we were able to, with um, the help of <clears> – <throat> Uh, Tom's daughter Laura um, to get Tom to camp in Virginia and uh, got him in there and had it set up and scouted and lo and behold the next morning turkeys came from a direction we weren't expected they what walked, they walked the exact turkeys <laughs> did turkey things but it was a beautiful morning very sun washed had two goblin turkeys walk 15 steps from me on their way down to Colonel Tom and nice. they stood in there and he picked it up just stone cold drew from his lap no shooting sticks no mr tripod. fox style he was very offended when we even suggested that maybe he might want a a shooting stick or something he said no no i'm gonna draw all right and he and he drew and just the barrel just it it never wavered he picked it up shot it and it was it was electric there were man tears shed and it was very exciting and it was just but it was very special to i don't know to be there for a moment when a tw- in a 24-hour period when every breath felt significant it really yeah. did yeah. and it was very special and it, i was telling my wife about it um the other night that i just don't even think i even grasp the significance of it yet and i think yeah, i don't think you do either. with each mo- <laughs> with, no with each with each no I, I know i mean with each moment i kind of get a little bit more um appreciation for it that, it huge. was very special and just an honor to be there and to see it happen with my own eyes so 96 years 96 old. yeah and, and you hit the record button steven spurlock was there to film it okay. with, with the chasing 49 guys right. but i took pictures of the whole thing and it was incredibly special and just i i do it all over again on purpose i mean it was great it was unbelievable to watch and very special to be there so wow, that's cool i yeah. can't the current time imagine who the wouldn't want to be there yeah. i mean that's just Colonel Tom Kelly, author of The Tenth Legion and a host of other books. On the board, baby. On the that's, board. At 96. That's, <laughs> at 96. That's really cool. And I don't know if you – I mean, I'm, I'm sure some of you have read the books, but there's a few YouTube videos, mm-hmm. uh, and they will bring tears to your eyes. And oh, if, if you've never had chill bumps before, go watch a couple of those videos. Well, the books do the same. Yeah, it, 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 was, it, was, it was incredible, something I'll never, ever forget, and – like I said, just an honor to be there, but to to stand there, to listen to his stories at the night before at dinner, mm-hmm. to just to 
to see the same fire in his eyes, you know, that he's had since he was younger, maybe more, just incredibly special. So congrats to Tom Kelly, Keith Ott, and Kyle for putting that together with, with Daniel, and it was just awesome. Big deal. Thanks yeah. for, And thank yeah, you, is. Laura, can for your get, trust. Can we get some horns on that Yeah, one? That we ought to get some horns on yeah. that one for sure. Richie did. There he is, Richie. Here we go. Here. <laughs> so what else have you guys got as far as blood in the biologic? I got a couple, but I'll let y'all go first. Go ahead, Bob. Well, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Th- th- thank you. So, um, look, last week we had uh, Dr. Mike Chamberlain, and he has reported in from – he's in South Dakota and Nebraska, and he's sent in He's bird. on the road, yep, man. So he's, he's killed a couple of birds on the road. So good for him. That was good. We didn't fling any uh, – you know, it didn't last, I should say, and that'll be a story <laughs> that he can tell at some point. But <laughs> had a so, lo- had a long weekend. Yeah. So uh, there's another guy, a friend of mine named Joey Hunter from uh, from from Weetumpka, Alabama. What Tumpka? Working on his uh, Grand Slam, and he killed a bird in Wyoming yesterday. Big nice. bird. So I always like to hear the guys that are chasing that Grand Slam. Yeah, getting on the road. So the, the and, and look, uh, Rob, we need to make sure guys are aware that the 2023 turkey stamps here is a little late. That's right. Yeah. Here and you jump on the website and go buy those. Yep, fifteen dollars shipped to your door. Su- support wild turkey research. For Gamekeeper grants. Hundred yeah. percent of it goes to wild turkey That's research. Right. And yep. what's about this gun? Can you real quick? You yeah. Got, oh yeah. For tell so us about that. the Low Country Game Bird Foundation out of South Carolina has combined with. Benelli, Rob Roberts, and Mossy Oak to put together a Mr. Fox turkey gun. It's an SB328 gauge, special gun. Um, it's got Mr. Fox's signature on there. It's got the Mr. Fox logo and the Low Country Game Bird Foundation logo as well. They're going to raffle that. All the proceeds of that are going to go again. They're going to use that to put buy turkey stamps and then to benefit turkey research. So Daniel ended up shooting that gun, killing a turkey with it in South Carolina. He Sweet. left it, He left his gun at home, and we said, well, Guess what we got? <laughs> we got this twenty-eight gauge. Yeah. So we we bummed a shell from somebody, and he killed one with it. So oh, more cool. details to come on that, but that's that's really cool. That sounds really good. So I'll, we'll learn more about how to be involved in the raffle. Yeah, we'll, we'll put some, we'll we'll put a link. The, the raffle will start, I believe, in the in first week of second week or second week of May. We'll get more details about that, but that's something to be looking. It out is for. a slick looking it gun. Is. It's bad. Oh, it's man. awesome. Nice. And they say the twenty-eight gauge is like the perfect gauge. For and that's these. Rob. That's the guy we had on the podcast. Yeah, about Rob that. Roberts. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And he talked about it. So. Yeah, he said yeah. it was the best gun he's ever done. It's wow. beautiful. Yep. It's in, oh, yeah. Wait. It's in green leaf, too, in case you didn't know. Wow. So there you go. Wow. All right. So, uh, Austin, have you got any blood on the biologic? Seems like one of your youngins just killed a couple of turkeys. Yeah, my 15-year-old is uh, reminded me that um, patience is – greatly needed um even when you've been doing this for 30 years um talked me out of leaving a bird the other day that wasn't doing what i thought he should do and we ended up killing him a little bit later and, and could have doubled had we had another gun so um mm. yeah it's been been good and killed him right on a little uh half acre clover plus field on top of a ridge in tennessee so pretty special place nice so the teacher became the student he did. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Patience. Hey, uh, Hayden, is, believe it or not, Hayden tells me to slow down all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still well, a student, and I'm 48. Fair, there, was a goblin, there was a goblin bird on the other ridge, and I I had a axe to grind. And so you know how it is when the one you have isn't acting right. You're like, well, let's go to this other one. He There's said, another one over there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a lot of options now, it doesn't seem like. Do you? I mean, when you're – I'm not just hearing the turkeys like and have options. We need to go with Austin. Yeah, no, I've never heard it like that down here. <laughs> That's for sure. I'll let yeah. you know how much that uh, my lease payment is, and we can split it. Hey, I'm in for that. Yeah, well, we'll work <laughs> something out. We'll pay for turkeys. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let, uh, guys, before we get into this, do you think that? And I'm being serious here. I'm not trying to. You're always so serious. Yeah. So I had a guy call a little while ago, that, uh, and I was trying to tell him about some subject matter, and I said, listen, we've got a podcast you can listen to. Or, and I, he asked about he's, – he said, I'm having a hard time getting up with Dudley. Well, Dudley's a hard guy to get up with. He's at concerts he's, all the no, time. No, I am not. Scared. He's very but, busy. So he said, I need a native nursery catalog. And I, I said, I don't think we have one, but you can go to on the web. And he said, yeah. well, I'm Amish, and I don't, I don't do – We don't do the web. He doesn't do the internet. 
So are they li- are the Amish listening to this podcast? Mm-hmm. Uh, I is, would. This is something to ponder. I would guess not, but you know, maybe <laughs> if they're. <laughs> I kind of with Dudley on this one. It just got me, you know, like what it. But they can talk on the phone. I think it just depends on you know that their local. Yeah, kind of, kind of rules and I things. Don't, yeah. Some of them are more. We don't like, have we don't have Amish here, so not that I, I guess there might be some in They uh, they definitely fear the same <laughs> God we do for sure. They just live a different lifestyle. Yeah, well, well there you got a number some... to call back when you when you. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll probably just have to print out the whole website <laughs> and send it to them. <laughs> We've done that before. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot, a lot of the, there are a lot of hunters in that Amish community. Absolutely, so. I mean, you go to a big trade show. Um, there's a lot of. Oh, yeah, go to the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania trade show, the Eastern Sports Show. Yeah. Lots of this gentleman was from Punxsutawney. That's oh. exactly where he's from. And it, it, so, he, he, you know, I wrote down. Let me just tell you this. So I wrote okay. down his, you know, Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. I said, you're going to have to spell that. And he said, P-A. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, so before we get started, Rob, thank you. Uh, you're going to kind of morph into our in-the-field reporter, bringing us back stories like uh, the Colonel Tom Kelly report. I appreciate that. Yeah, looking forward to it. Our mustachioed yeah. reporter. Yeah, there he is. Rob Kenny. In-house. There he is. Can I steal some more th- thunder here real quick? You yeah, sure. 15 sure. seconds. Ben and I killed a turkey together. First one we ever killed together. Back back home in Tennessee, opener. How did I congrats, forget about Congrats, that. Ben. I apologize. So, wearing a Mr. Fox vest. Yeah, wearing our Mr. Fox vest. First turkey I ever called up for somebody else, and it was with a, a trumpet that yeah. David put me on. And Ben, what's Ben's last name? Ben Kenny. Ben Kenny. That would be his, his brother. brother. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I'm trying to get him to explain that. That was <laughs> good to have told when he said yeah, that. Yeah, you're right. Ben Kenny. Yeah. Rob, I am sorry I forgot to get you on the blood. I, that's okay. Seven, but I knew and, you'd uh, be here to redeem yourself. <laughs> I tell you what, um, that was awesome. By the I way. got teary eyed watching Lake Pickles stuff with his dad and his brother. That was awesome. insane. What Shout happened out Lake. that? Well, just they got all got together. I think his uh, brother, fin- Brett, I believe is his name, finally got his first turkey. I want to say uh, last time they all got together, he may have missed or something. Mm-hmm. But uh, it all I came just, together. Yeah, I ate that one up. So it, it makes great. turkey season special. Yeah, That's I true. love seeing the whole family, you know, together. Yeah. It's cool. That's Reminds good. me of those pictures you were talking, showing me the other day. Oh, yeah. It's nice. All right, guys. So right. let's uh, let's kind of turn our attention. We've got two guests via Zoom that are here with us, and uh, Heath North and Jason Peroni. And they're from Stratton Seed Company. Can we hit the horns there, Rich? Absolutely. And we've had a long-standing relationship with these yeah. guys. Heath may be, when, when you talk to him, he may know more about farming and growing things yep. than anybody ever and being able to explain it he's just he's brilliant Impressive. and i'm hoping we can get him to teach us and and, and help us understand about how to grow some warm season crops for our whitetails and they're also yeah they're also really big hunters uh they know what they're doing so you you combine that knowledge of, of soybeans and ag crop and soil chemistry with uh great woodsmen and get good stuff that's yeah. how you get good stuff so like, heath we're glad to have you are you there yeah we are here appreciate you guys letting us uh participate today but hope you didn't oversell it for us those were some mighty kind words i believe to, to start this thing off with so appreciate <laughs> well, that. we're just glad sure. i think you guys were at the snarky puppy concert last night too oh my gosh <laughs> we, we had some kind of puppy concert I, i'm not sure <laughs> but uh, we, we participated somehow we'll put it that way well i'm glad to know you guys over there with your sleeves rolled up and are working because right now it's probably a busy time for anybody in the in the ag seed business for sure it, it is we we both are kind of jealous of listening to all y'all's hunting stories right now because we've kind of been stuck in the saddle over here for for a month or two now just getting things prepped and ready and, and getting out but uh we're we're hopeful to participate before it's said and done with so that flat ground all those big ag field do y'all have many turkeys over there where y'all are we really don't have a lot right here. You can get into the western part of the state, uh, get to more of that mountainous range, or what we would call mountainous range, the trees, whatnot. Uh, it we get into a few, but it's pretty barren here in the on the prairie for sure. I never have understood that. I mean, Arkansas just seems like it'd be loaded with them. I don't know. 
I bet that Crowley's Ridge has got some turkeys on it. Got to. It's got some deer on it. Yeah. Sure. Crowley's Ridge is an, is neat. You know, we have what's called the Thick Luss region, which is just due east of the Mississippi Delta. Mm-hmm. And gajillions of years ago, it was formed from dust in the air that landed. Hmm. Um, and most, and it's incredibly good soil, uh, really good for farming. It's also one of the most erodible soils in the world, but yeah, that Crowley's Ridge is the exact same thing. It's just a smaller formation and it's on the other other side of the Mississippi Delta or or on the (laughs) other side of the river. (laughs) So yeah, he does. I thought it wasn't glaciers. Well, glacial dust. Okay, yeah. okay. So not like dust. Yeah. Okay. Ashes to ashes. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we learned something. I, I didn't know that. I always thought Crowley's Ridge popped up during that earthquake many, many years ago that made the river run north instead of south. What was that? It was a big earthquake. Do you remember that, Lanny? I wasn't around. You the New around. Madrid earthquake? <laughs> yeah. I, I thought that might have caused it. It might have. That was, uh, what's the big duck hunting lake at Real Foot? You know, Is that, what that it, it formed that. Mm. Huh. Well, you know, our guests are being really quiet. I bet they probably know the answers to all these <laughs> questions that we're talking about. Maybe so. But, Some of it was a little before my time as well, so uh, we'll, we'll have to uh, lean on, on Dudley's knowledge there. I, I'm learning a lot sitting here listening, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bet you know. <laughs> well, hey, look, let, okay, let's, let's get serious. Let's start. You know, we've got these uh, biologic game changer soybeans that we work with you guys to develop. And there's got to be some tips, tricks, techniques, ways to just make these things perform even better. And uh, first off, can you tell us, tell our audience a little bit about these beans and what makes them different and unique? Sure. So biologic game changers that we're promoting are a Roundup Ready One or glyphosate tolerant soybean. So uh, from a herbicide aspect, that gives us lots of options to have a real nice clean plot. Uh, it's a, a uh, later maturing soybean, meaning that there's more days that the soybeans have green leaves, green pods before the dry down. Uh, growth habits uh, are very aggressive. Uh, a lot of a lot of tall growth that's what we like to see in the forage and even we use these beans for uh hay farmers as well believe it or not but um you know it's just a really adaptive bean that can fit you know we moved from wisconsin down to uh florida with these things and uh, have had good results from nearly everyone we talked with uh, uh with the soybeans soybeans are just so adapted to their situations it makes it a little easier in some circumstances the seeds a little bigger a little easier to get up out of the ground it's just it's an overall good plant good seed for wildlife so you know soybeans and big whitetails are kind of synonymous yeah and but what what we've learned through the years is that not all soybeans are equal and not all soybeans are as palatable to deer as others. And can you speak to that a little bit, Heath? Sure. Well, we know, you know, soybeans in general, they're a major source of protein, right? So even a soybean seed itself, you know, composition is is in the upper 30s to low 40% protein, which is very high. So, you know, that is the seed itself, the, the leaf structure, everything that's on these things are, are packed full of protein and even phosphorus at this point. So uh, there are a lot of good micronutrients inside of these soybeans. But, you know, the palatability, you know, through what we've done research wise, uh, you know, we've, we've found a good balance of both pod production and leaf production with these. Because if you get into some forage type beans, you see that you know, you don't get as much pod or seed production that later busts open and falls on the ground for the deer to eat even after the fact of uh, of the plant itself drying down. So, you know, the palatability of not only the leaves, but even just that popping open of the seed pods has really shown a long life uh, to the uh, palatability and the uptake to the deer, to be honest, and at a time when protein is very important to them throughout you know, early season and even into that late season as well. 
when you look you know, at the light season, sorry, on the late season, you know, I found that they will dry down, but they really hold in the pods well and they don't deteriorate. They don't rot like some ag beans do. And they seem to do very nice and hold up through the late season that I found. Yeah. It seems like you guys have really found the, the happy medium, uh, but it's also combat compatible for everybody north to south. Mm. It's, almost like the silver bullet so you've got like you said you've got the forage aspect and it makes pods it stays standing over the winter uh just it's got everything so uh one thing i wanted to ask uh i know we have talked about determinate versus versus indeterminate before are these uh, are they determinate or indeterminate so this will be an indeterminate bean, which, you know, as we know, means that once a, a soybean gets to a certain development stage, a determinate bean, once it starts to flower and put pods on, the vegetative growth stops. An indeterminate bean will continue that vegetative state, so that's where we get that height, that extra little bit of forage towards the end of middle of season for these soybeans, and it's definitely... Uh, something that you want in a forage type bean because it even handles browse pressure better. They have a the growth node, the terminal node, the very tip top of the plant. As long as that thing doesn't get snipped out, uh, you continue to have shoots that come off of it and continue to have more leaf and uh, vegetative production, and which can result even in more pod production at the same time. Right. So yeah, back to the happy medium. I mean, you're getting. Big beans, they may not all mature at exactly the same time because they're indeterminate, but it's it's uh, like an ag bean. It's it's a hybrid, you know, like a cross between an ag bean and a forage bean. So, yeah. Well, so home that, run. That, that, that was one of the things I wanted to <clears throat> try to understand was that determinate versus indeterminate. That's a good explanation there. So, Heathen, your experience, is there a minimum size plot to, for growing – Soybeans? <laughs> well, that, that's a tough question for sure. And you guys probably have as much experience with it as what we do. You know, we, we try to gear everything at a minimum towards an acre, but, you know, it all depends on your browse pressure in itself. I mean, there's some places where your deer density is so high, you know, like I said, if you, if, if they were to eat that terminal node out, you're unfortunately done with the soybeans. So, you know, if you can get to an acre, a couple acre, two, three acres, it, it really all depends on your deer density, to be honest. It, it's difficult to, to finite a minimum plot. I think you need to have some kind of correlation to your deer population, to be honest. I, I think that's more of a key than anything is the deer density. You know, I was in Kansas turkey hunting last week, and, you know, I'm not, I wasn't familiar, and they do not have the deer density as we do in the Delta, it seems. So I say in the Delta where you have a higher deer, deer density, you know, you, I always say a rule of thumb when I'm telling my people, I always do 10%. So if they got a hundred acres, I would like to see 10 acres of food plots. Uh, no, they can't always do that, but as close as they can to it, that's fine. But up in Kansas where the deer density isn't high, you could get away with two, three, four percent, you know, something like that. It's really more on your deer density to me than anything. And, you know, maybe to follow that up, even uh, it'll be timing uh, of browse at the same time. So, you know, young soybeans, there's not that much there, obviously, when they're popping out of the ground. It's a whole lot easier to, to clip that, that growth node out. So if you get some height on your, your plot, whether it be, you know, 10, 12 inches, that gives them something else to browse on other than that terminal node, it's going to survive a lot better. But that, that first month to month and a half of browse pressure is where you will see a major impact on on the long term of your plot when, if you wanted to identify that terminal <laughs> node or bud what what would it what would it look like it, it's the very top of the plant the very center top so where it grows from Plants, uh, soybean plants have nodes. So a node is where each leaf section comes off as you see the plant grow. So a, a soybean plant will have typically 12 to even 25 nodes, just depending on the height that it gets. So each level of leaves is a node. 
and they start in that terminal node at the very top center of the plant. Same place you'd hang the star on a Christmas tree, Bobby. Exactly. Okay. That makes sense. Well, can you guys explain the uh, the need for uh, – well, my mind just went blank here. Hang on with me, Heath. But uh, what is it that the, the, the uh, soybeans are en- – yeah, okay, here we go. Mark that time code, Rich. So, <laughs> Heath, can you guys explain inoculants and, and whether a food plot guy needs them or not? Uh, it can go either way, to be honest. Uh, inoculation is basically putting a bacteria into the soil with the soybean. That's what inoculating is. Uh, uh, those bacteria are what actually form on the roots to make nodules. So if you were to pull a soybean plant up and you see little white balls on the uh, root system, those are called nodulations. And those nodulations are what help the plant pull nitrogen from the air to feed the plant. So basically you're you're by inoculating you are allowing the plant to make its own nitrogen to use because we all know lagoons are very good nitrogen producers. So that's a lot of your clovers even different any kind of lagoon most of the time will have an inoculant and an inoculant is used in places where maybe you haven't had a, a plot in the past, or if you're establishing a new plot, it's probably the most important at that time to look at inoculation just to be sure fresh ground to get that nitrogen fixation because that bacteria may not be in the soil. Because again, if you had had a plot there that had beans in the past or whatever, you know, those microbes live in the soil without the plant. So the more concentration that you get, the the more nitrogen fixation or nodulation you would have so probably the most important time to inoculate is on the front end of a very new plot or something that hasn't been established very long well that 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 makes sense because uh you know we just we we end up uh hearing a lot of guys say ask questions about inoculation Mm -hmm. and how important it is Mm -hmm. and and uh, so uh, as, as cheap as it is uh, and you're doing food plots that aren't, you know, aren't exactly precision agriculture, um, you know, you may be far away where you can't get lime on it and stuff. And there's not a, as much of a living component of the soil. I would say just air to caution and, and inoculate them. You know, you're very inexpensive per acre. So an inoculation is very cheap insurance, I would say, at that point, because, you know, if any of us go out and plant a clover plot and we look at the analysis on the bag, you don't get a a pound of clover that doesn't have inoculant on it. It's just a standard practice that they go out and and, uh, with an inoculant on it. Yeah. You know, I'm dating myself, but when I was about 15 years old, one of the first food plots I planted was some soybeans. I talked to a guy named Jimmy Phillips, who was a farmer, and let me hunt his place. And he said, well, I'll help you. Look, go get the beans. And he told me to pick up some inoculant. And I remember it being just jet black. And mm-hmm. we had a tub and poured those beans mm-hmm. in this tub. And he pulled a Coca-Cola. He worked for the Coca-Cola company. He pulled a six-ounce Coke out and sprayed it all over those beans and poured that inoculant. And he said the Coke would make it stick to them. Mm-hmm. You ever heard anybody doing that, Heath? I don't know if I've heard about the coat piece, to be honest with you. You know, uh, the, the the inoculant that we've got today is both powder and liquid form, so you've got options on either way to go with that. But, you know, it's important getting it next to the seed and, and sticking it to the seed like that will definitely get it off to a better start, for sure. Yeah, I've heard of the same thing, but I, I don't think it's necessary. You know, we're talking about billions and billions of little bacteria, uh, rhizobia, and it— you don't need much, and it just sticks to the seed, really. The more we learn about growing things for for wildlife, it, it kind of everything seems to go back to the soil and the health of the soil. Hundred percent. And these bacteria, I guess, are, you know, it's just, just another component to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, they're basically a nutrient transfer yeah. agent, you know. So. Thank you, Mister Donald. Wow. D- Dudley, <laughs> Dudley, Dudley taught me that. It is, guys. You know, you you think about soil, and I know you guys uh, promote, you know, 
is taking soil samples, stuff like that. But for any crop, whether it's soybeans or any food plot that you need, you know, if those nutrients aren't available to the plant, it, you're spinning your wheels for the most part. So, you know, pH balance, uh, everything. Yeah, if your pH is off, you could be locking up your sulfur, your magnesium, stuff like that, and it doesn't get to the plant. So soil health is for sure your your number one starting point on a, any kind of plot. Uh, whether it be, I mean, even in the agriculture world, that that's our number one starting point is where's your soil at. Okay. Well, uh, so we know they're a legume, and typically you don't hear of folks adding nitrogen when they're fertilizing. Um, but you do hear of folks using it sometimes. Uh, and I guess the theory behind that is, you know, before the plant is able to nodulate and fix its own nitrogen, would it hurt just to have a pinch of nitrogen in the mix to get the plants up and running a little quicker? I know people say it may cause weed problems, but, you know, this is, uh, we can take care of the weeds now with these soybeans. So what are, what are your thoughts on that, guys? You know, a good starter fertilizer, but your, uh, your phosphorus and your potassium are probably the most important to soybeans because of that. But as a starter, you know, a simple triple 13 or triple 19, something like that, just to really get it a boost would, is not going to hurt. You're not going to hurt the soybean by putting nitrogen out, um, you know, getting it in timely and uh, getting getting that fertilized to the roots is going to be the most important part or to the young seedling. Um, so to, I don't know what that it will gain you a whole lot, but it definitely won't hurt you to take that extra little bit of precaution for no more putting putting into the acre. So uh, that brings me to a, a question that I've got, to, and you know we kind of learn from what the, the the obviously the farming world has knows how to do all this, and it, sometimes you ride through Lanny, you see them; these fields are just beautiful. There's no weeds. It's just you guys have got it down pat. But is there a so many days that y'all typically say after they're planted that you that you then come back and spray glyphosate on game changers it won't matter you can spray at or at emergence it you you basically have every option that widens your window for any kind of application you know for for the best possible applications start clean and stay clean is kind of a good attitude to take on where uh, if you plant them, go ahead and spray, make sure everything's killed or however you're, you're um, incorporating uh, the beans into the ground, whether it's a broadcast method or a drill method. Starting clean and staying clean is probably the, the easiest way to think about it. Uh, hitting it with a roundup at planting or a few days after just to ensure that you're, you're uh, got a good, clean ground to start with. Do folks use pre-emergence with Roundup Ready beans? Is that, I mean, like if, just say you're disking up some ground that's just incredibly weedy, it's never really been farmed before, um, would that be something you guys would recommend, or do you just wait until the beans pop up and hit them with glyphosate? No, absolutely. Uh, anything that you can do to hold back, um, dole is a, a good um pre-emergent herbicide for soybeans. So, you know, we even, that dual is something that can be tank mixed with glyphosate. So you can actually put those together and come out and spray, kill what's there and hold back anything else that's looking at coming out of the ground other than the soybeans in the, in the probably a two week window. Okay. The, the so, key to pre-emergence though, is that you have most of almost all have to have water for activation. So, Timing it up with the rain on that spring, or if you, if you do happen to irrigate, those are your, you really need about a half inch of rain uh, equivalency to okay. activate those pre emergent chemicals. So, just to clarify, he said dual, D U A L. I think it's dual magnum or something, but uh, yeah, it's uh -oh. two ingredients, uh, and then I, I assume they have generics by now. Yeah, uh, believe what is it, metulachlor would be your active ingredient. So uh, goes by many trade names out there, but that's a pretty common older chemistry that that's available for uh, pre-emergence on soybeans. Okay. 
So, Austin, uh, we don't want to lose you here in the conversation. Have you got anything to add so far to what we've been talking about? Well, I, one thing I wanted to ask Keith and his guys were, you know, if they had any suggestions on that first spraying because I get asked about that a lot. And I've never had any bad experiences with any of our soybeans being sprayed too early. But that's always a fear in the in the back of a lot of people's mind is that, you know, their roundup is their glyphosate's gonna get put out too early and potentially uh injure a plant. Um I, I did want to ask Keith and them when they're really dialing in those soybeans, have they have y'all found a ideal temperature that they like to be planted at versus other ag beans? Or are they all in that once we get in that 60, 65 degree range, as long as you're not going to get a cold rain on them, or is, is 60 warm enough? Uh, 60 is probably the ideal temperature to start at. Uh, soybeans can germinate even in, in down to 50 degrees. So if you happen to get that cold snap after the fact, for the most part, you'll be okay. Um, the, you know, obviously the warmer that it is, there's, uh, growing uh, degree units basically heat units that a soybean needs to be able to uh, germinate and emerge but even in those colder temperatures it still can get those it just may take longer so in in the summertime we may see or in late spring after the soil's already warmed up i've personally put plots out in the morning and gone back in the afternoon and the seed is already imbibed and imbibed meaning taking in it it's water that it needs inside the seed coat to uh, sprout, germinate. But even in that afternoon, after roughly 12 hours, it's already done that and, and actually starting to peg out with a small root system. But uh, the flip side to that is I've, I've planted my ag beans already and I've planted them roughly a week and a half ago and have yet to see emergence yet. But Soybeans can stay in the ground in cooler temperatures for three to four weeks potentially and still germinate. So, you know, it, it to answer your question, it, it's hard to determine that, that opportune plant time right now, with, especially with the weather patterns we've been having. But, you know, a rule of thumb we've always gone to in our area uh, here in southeast Arkansas is usually around uh, – Easter is what we shoot for because in times we've gotten snow at Easter and in times we've been at 85 degrees at Easter. So it's just, uh, -huh. uh you know, uh, crap shoot really at that point. But, uh, nervous land. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be really getting nervous. It's, uh, it's a week and a half for me and I'm, I'm nervous, but you got, it's, uh, you know, but just like farming food plotting is, is somewhat of a, uh, a, uh, gut wrenching feeling sometimes when you work so hard and, and <laughs> two weeks later you still see no results at that point. But, uh, you we you all work, it, work hard again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, to, to piggyback on Austin's question, you know about the spraying. Um, a lot of my customers ask me, once you put the dual down and round up, how long will that hold the weeds roughly, and then how late? Can they spray Roundup that will not affect pod production on those beans? Uh, so, you know, Dual has an application window uh, or Matula or will have on the bottom to kind of help you understand when the intervals of spraying are. But each time it rains, that chemical reactivates. So that's why mm -hmm. I say it's important not only to get it out before rain, but, you know, at that Easter time frame when we're still catching spring rain. So each time that we get a rain, that chemical reactivates and, you know, two to three weeks later, you still have some active chemicals on the ground that's helping control these things. But all you're trying to do is get the canopy. And with the population, seed population that we put out, uh, 40 to 50 pounds per acre, that compared to an ag system that's a very high seed population but that's what we want with these soybeans to get them up get them canopied and not even hopefully not have to make that late application of glyphosate but it's there if you need it you know anything you do with glyphosate you want to do prior to flowering because that's really when you start seeing it dinging and hurting your uh, pod production so you've got a really wide window but by the time you get to that 
flowering system, flowering time of the plant, you should be at a level where your canopy and your canopy is shading out your ground, shouldn't have any major weed issues coming on at that point. Hey, um, Austin, is, is it, have you had any experience? I know you have. Can you speak to spraying the glyphosate, but adding like our mean green fertilizer in there as well and the success you've had with that? Yeah, for sure. So, um, it's even with these beans a couple of years ago, uh, I, I'm a huge herbicide junkie and, and trying to make sure that when, you know, you're taking the time, the effort and the money to go out and spray a crop to do it right. So that not only do you get a successful turnout, but we also don't want to be out there just dinging weeds up and not thoroughly killing them. So, the mean green is our water soluble fertilizer for uh, listeners that may not know. Um, and it also has a micronutrient package in it. So I think it can be a really big bump to the soybeans during that growing period, especially if they get a little stressed out later in the summer when the, the rainfall starts to drop off a little bit uh, under the right conditions. I prefer uh, later in the evening myself. Uh, that's just personal preference. If you're going to go back in and, and clean the beans up a little bit more with some glyphosate to mix in a, a foliar herbicide or a, a foliar fertilizer that is going to feed those soybeans directly through the leaves, even if there's not a real quick upcoming rain. Uh, the, the main green does have a little bit of nitrogen in it, like we talked earlier, but with you know, if everything's canopied out, you're not really worried about feeding any weeds because you're going to be cleaning them up with. Uh, the glyphosate anyway and it you know the nitrogen content kind of uh, makes those weeds suck up that herbicide a little quicker uh, just because of that nitrogen action so always a good idea in my experience if you got the time and, and the money to put in a uh, foliar fertilizer with your herbicide just because they they work great together and i've never had any tank mixing issues with mean green and any glyphosate whether it be a uh, generic or roundup brand um so i'm a big fan of it myself to give that really late summer boost uh, to those soybeans especially like i said if they're struggling a little bit from a lack of rainfall good yeah i was gonna just tell everybody since i'm the one that brought up the the pre-emergent uh the dual um, make sure you read the label guys, because, you know, those pre-emergent herbicides, uh, they're, you know, they're soil active and they may not, I guess you could say wear out, uh, in time for your fall food plots. So, uh, always read the label and make sure that whatever you're planting in the fall is compatible with that particular pre-emergent herbicide or make sure you know it'll probably give you like a 60 day or 40 day when it when it kind of wears out and, and you don't have to worry about it anymore and it, it actually even fluctuates with the soil texture so if you have a clay it may last longer than if you have a sandy soil so just be cognizant of that guys um, uh, but uh, that's, a, that's a great point Dudley and something else that we probably should point out that I know y'all probably remember us dealing with years and years ago with other glyphosate tolerant crops is when you're out buying your glyphosate or your Roundup brand, make sure that's all that's in it. Do not go out and buy Roundup from Lowe's because it may also have 2% of 2,4-D or Dicamba. Yeah. There's that infamous red jug that you see often that's you know mostly glyphosate but it'll have a little touch of a mazapir in it and you don't want yeah, i mean it, it would work work. great it works great for certain applications if you're trying to clean up before establishing natives or uh you know they use that uh for forestry uses and things like that but uh yeah double check the label always yeah yeah these soybeans are not uh 24d dicamba tolerant <laughs> it's, it's glyphosate only heath what else do we need to know about these uh the beans before we move on to some other stuff but well, lanny just so uh my question is you know real quick even for me i mean soybeans are uh an intimidating 
<clears throat> I guess, crop to plant. So um, I just, can you speak to the fact that you don't have to have a seed drill? You know, you can really do this in some remote areas and, and how you would kind of go about uh, doing it in those areas versus a uh, typical agricultural site. Sure. Uh, you know, like we talked about, and we all know soybeans are pretty resilient in what they do. What is probably most detrimental in planting soybeans is planting them too deep. Uh, soybeans, when they germinate and start sprouting, they kind of roll out of the seed. They don't push straight up like you would think of with a grass or, some, or you know, any other kind of plant that, that maybe is not a lagoon or a dicot. But uh, in, in that rolling process, if they happen to be too deep and the soil gets too compact on top of them, uh, it will actually break off under the ground. So that's one thing that you got to watch out for if you're planting is doing your best to keep them at the level of moisture without probably saying going past probably two inches deep, to be honest. Uh, you want to be mindful of, of your soil conditions at that point. But, you know, a, a 40 to 50 pound sack that we're putting out and we recommend that per acre, uh, is going to be roughly a seed population of 170 to upwards of 185,000 seeds per acre, which is a very high population, which again, we want for the canopy as well as the browse pressure. But that can be broadcast or drilled at that, that rate and, you know, covered up. If you've got the option to cover it up, up with a uh, small scratcher or some kind of hair that you can just get it right under the ground ahead of a rain. But, you know, getting it to the moisture is probably the most, the second most important part of, of getting the soybean in the ground because it, like I said, we talked about it imbibing that water. That all happens within a 24 hour period. So if you can get the soybeans in the ground in the moisture for 24 hours, you stand a really good chance of getting it to, to, to pip out and actually start taking root and hopefully be able to uh, pull in that moisture from surrounding it through the root system instead of being reliant on exactly where it's at. But you, you just, it's a fine line of being too wet, not wet enough at that point. I get hundreds of calls in the springs and all sorts of stories from everybody doing different types of planting practices. Uh, I've got the guys who have access to disc and they disc it and they get their spreaders behind their side by side or four wheeler and they spread it and cover it with a cedar tree and that works good. I've got them uh, planting onto Johnson grass or just some grass and then bush hogging over the top and having that canopy and let a rain get on top of it. That seems to work because they're getting good soil contact. Um, I always tell them first number one practice try to drill it if you don't have a drill which most people don't number two get the ground worked um, broadcast it at the rate we're trying to um, get accomplished and barely covered you know like he said don't bury these things and then a last result resort is uh, just put it on top of the ground if you got access to a bush hog cover it up if you see a rain coming I've done it personally myself works all the time so these beans are very hardy. The original game changer, the, the original one, is super tough bean. All soil types. Uh, I've had that bean go into water. It just seems to work excellent in very tough conditions. So That's good like, to hear. I can't wait to try yeah, the throwing mode throw in, in our <laughs> new <laughs> test area. Yeah, we got to get to work on that. Glad you're back from the show. Yeah, yeah. Dudley loves that method. Huh, interesting. Yeah, that's really good. Well, so, I mean, really, have, you can, there's a lot you know, of different people just don't process. have the equipment, you know. Right, um, yeah. You know, these guys, we deal, you guys, too, you deal with all sorts of clientele. You got the, you know, the, some of the weekend warrior guys just trying to plant a half acre, a quarter acre plot, and you got the big guys planting 40, 50 acres of these things. So, you know, a lot of people just don't have access to the equipment that they need. And uh, we're lucky to borrow some from friends and family. So, you know, I just, we have to adapt to each each different environment and try to help these guys, you know, buy the product and plant it again next year. So we're just trying to help best way we can. What, uh, what group are these beans? Oh, it's a, it's a mid group five, early to mid group five sort of bean, which, you know, a basically maturity groups, uh, start at even triple zeros, honestly, uh, down to group seven. So basically what that means is, how long until the soybeans have mature seed in them. So triple zeros being your earliest, group seven and eights, which are almost non-existent anymore, are your very late maturing. So that November, December timeframe before those guys are even really 
starting to dry down, losing their green leaves. But all beans are, uh, almost all beans are what we call photoperiod sensitive. So that's why Game Changer works so well from the north to the south is because it's, it does require heat to grow, obviously, and to mature and develop. But a lot of its maturity is dependent upon day lengths. So as the days actually start getting shorter, that's what triggers a soybean to actually start reproducing. So the longer the maturity, the shorter the days have to be for it to start reproducing. And even with this game changer being an indeterminate variety, even after it starts to flower to reproduce, it's still getting that um, uh, vegetative growth. So again, another reason why it fits so well in, in our application here from hay beans to uh, all of our deer beans that we're putting out at this point. Soybeans are fun. And uh, one thing I just thought of to mention is that, uh, you know, we're also into establishing natives. And so you can just say you've got an old pasture that's full of fescue or timothy or, you know, some kind of cattle grass. You could grow soybeans in it for a couple of years. And with that, you know, roundup resistance, you can get rid of a whole bunch of un unwanted stuff and then that next year you can go in with with native grasses and it's a lot easier to get them established because you've been spending a couple of years with a roundup ready crop getting all that all that another great thing about it too with soybeans and the game changer actually maturing out uh in the again in our part of the world probably the late september early october time frame is we still have time to actually get in and we promote and have seen it done several times where if you've got a grain crop that you're wanting to put or a grain plot that you're wanting to put in uh for the fall you can actually oversee the game changer soybeans with your fall food plot and once those beans mature and the leaves dry and fall off you actually have soil contact with those soybean leaves setting over the top and once you get a rain you've actually got your fall food plot coming up in the middle of your soil beans. that's awesome so you've got dry beans for them to eat on you know mm -hmm. foot two foot three foot off the ground and then you got all kinds of good green stuff underneath it a buffet yeah that's, a that, yeah, that's an awesome <laughs> heck yeah well you know when I, I don't have to, when I think about soybeans. Oh, here we go. You know, We're well, talking about the big deer on the wall. You know, Hercules he was uh, <laughs> grown yeah. up in that soybean no, he, world. Yeah, he so it, but but hey, well, you know, let's not leave this uh, soybean topic completely. But we've also, I mean, we you know, these we've had a lot of luck with uh, like we call them protein peas, yeah, with iron clay protein. peas, mung bean, all that added together. Those are uh, pretty easy to grow and nutritious as well. No doubt about it. You know, we you, uh, there's a little ad running on social now that Max, you know, hollering at everybody. The deer season starts now because it really does. You know, you got to get these spring pro products in the ground. Great protein sources for antler genesis. You know, a lot of people do clover, clover too. So, uh, but as we all know, you know, when you're growing them, right now is the time to grow. Them. I Absolutely. personally mixed uh, the game changers with some cow peas. And it negated, you know, I started clean, but it did negate the late spraying. So I just sprayed a select or post to kill my grasses. But what it did, the soybeans were growing tall and the cowpeas vined up it. August, September, I was telling him about it, man, it just made a tangled mess of uh, soybeans and peas. And it was, it was awesome. Man, why hadn't we thought of that, Bobby? Well, you know, we've kind of messed around with some similar stuff to that through the years. Yeah. We really have. Well, we're going to do that. Protein. Yeah, I'll tell you too, for what it's worth, uh, you know, we're we're trying to cultivate some of these crops here locally, seed production. We're in seed production as it is, and uh, we we ran a trial last year, and, and it caught me at the very tail end because we got a real early frost here one day that got me, but uh, I was super impressed by planting Lab Lab this past year. Oh, yeah. And, and you know how the drought was around here. And I'm telling you guys, this stuff was chest high on me, never been watered, uh, planted the 1st of May, and just, I mean, beautiful plants. And again, like uh, he said, uh, Jason said, we came over the top with uh, some clethodim, beautiful clean plot, lots of forage. It was just a beautiful plot. But 
for what it's worth from a drought tolerance, you know, you've got the cow peas, you've got the lab lab, but there's, there's a lot of great options in the legumes out there for us to all be considering. For sure. Yeah. Our, our mix is predominantly cow peas and mung beans, yeah. uh, which is similar, but. Uh, and we love lab lab. We've sold yeah. lab lab we, for a We just haven't been able to get it. Yes, yeah, it, it can be hard to get from time to time. Yeah. And, uh, and pretty, you got, you got any the production heat? piece that, that gets it, guys, because like we talked about, you know, they're, uh, 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 they're also photoperiod sensitive, so you've got to, like deep South Georgia, Florida is about the only place that you can really, and a lot of this even comes over from India because that's where Lab Lab obviously originated from, was from India. But I mean, there's there's a lot of cool things that that we're trying to pull together to go with these soybeans. That um, uh, it's I, I feel like we're going to have a pretty good thoroughfare as we move forward. Oh yeah. I want to recircle on, uh, we were talking about, you know, acreage or a percentage of your property that you need to plant, you know, based on the population of deer. What are some tricks? We, we were actually looking at uh, e-fences the other day and realized that they are pretty cost prohibitive these days. A lot more expensive than they used to be. And uh, what are some tricks you could do, you know, when you know the beans are coming up that, that you might be able to keep your deer out for uh, maybe a month uh, or five or six weeks to get those beans up and going before uh, they start hitting of, them. You spoke of Crowley's Ridge. I've got a customer over there and they got a high deer pressure. He put a, he did a little work and uh, he put up an electric fence and um, he said those beans got chest tall <laughs> and he took it down and the deer <laughs> absolutely hammered them in September. But uh, that's what he did because he has high density and he just, I don't have a big enough plot, he was saying. I've had several guys do that. I have some guys in southwest Arkansas, but particularly over in Crowley's Ridge, he said it worked great. So Yeah, they mm-hmm. do work great. Uh, and, you know, a lot of them are solar and you can reuse them, yes. but uh, it's a lot of money to get into one of those things. Uh, and so the for folks like me on a budget, um, I've had really good luck with uh, that yard fertilizer called Melorganite. Mm. Um, you can buy it just about anywhere. It's uh, it's called Melorganite. It's actually uh, made in Milwaukee, and so it's Milwaukee Organite. Uh, so I think they combine a lot yeah. of. Don't tell them what it really is. Okay. <laughs> well, it's it's a lot of. Uh, it's actually. Uh, uh, sewage treatment yeah. stuff that they uh, sterilize um, and it's also a lot of leftovers from the beer making process I believe yeah. but it makes a little bitty pellet uh, that you can get and it does not smell good but um, Imagine it's that. pathogen free <laughs> it's actually a, a fertilizer but you don't really put enough out for it to be a fertilizer rate you know you can put a bag or two per acre and I've, I've had good luck at, at it keeping the deer out keep the deer out but also three four weeks it's and a slow it, release fertilizer too it is yeah yeah i um, actually put it in the yard so Dudley, how much was that stuff do you remember i think it's about uh it's it's been a couple years since i bought it but i think it's you know 18 20 dollars a bag so you know maybe about 40 bucks an acre to I'm, keep your deer out for uh you know three to four weeks works pretty good <laughs> Did it, ah, does it kind of react, <laughs> reactivate, re smell uh, after a rain when you've seen it at that point? Um, it that's one of the problems. You know, rain can slow, slow. Yeah. You know, make it not last as long. Right. But um, I, I've I've heard and I've not seen it done. But you know, we hear that cayenne pepper has had that oh. ability where you can put it in a liquid form and spray over the top, but the need to reapply after every rain can get cumbersome after a little while. Um, I've had pretty good results using it like just around the radius. So you don't actually have to treat the whole plot, just the edge. Um, we know. started using it. We fertilize our trees with it to keep the deer from eating all the seed before we get it. That's how we yeah. started using it. Yeah, we put it underneath our seed trees when we're trying to collect seed. So anyway, if anybody wants to give that a shot, give it a shot. For a per, from a personal use, um, not me personally, but I know a guy who did. We have bad hogs and deer on our farm, and um, they put one of the guys uh, knows a beautician, and he 
told her to collect the hair. He oh, yeah. just went around with the hair and sprinkled it around, <laughs> sprinkled it around all the outside of the field, and it worked. Yeah, Toxie uses yeah. that a lot. We used to do the same thing with hogs. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, sure does. Yes. Sure. yes. There's not a stitch of hair in any barbershop in West Point because Toxie has swept it all up and has it in a trash bag. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> so, guys, is there, are, are there any tips or tricks about growing warm season plots that you guys that, that we forgot to mention? No, like I said, you know, we talked about to begin with, but, you know, Warm season, cool season, whatever it is, soil health is probably one of the major things to start with, and just being sure of where your where your pH levels are and what you need. It getting that right start is probably going to be one of the biggest things to to keep in mind as you get ready to put these things in the ground. So, is there, it's kind of uh, obviously we're talking about planting these in the spring. We we've, we've talked about soil temperatures at least being in the sixties, but what if a guy misses all that and sometime around june or july he'd like to try to get some beans in the ground is he too late he, he's not too late uh you know again with them with soybeans being photo period sensitive you might not quite get the height that you would see with early planted beans and you run the risk of running out of a little more moisture in those summertime periods but outside of that the soybean is is super resilient and will be popped up out of the ground probably within three or four days at that point if you've got adequate moisture. But, um, you know, you'll still see it mature out at the same time as the beans that if we planted in April or May at that, or, you know, late April, early May at that point. So it, it's, like I said, probably one of the most versatile crops that, that we have, to be honest. Crazy to hear, but um, I've got people, at both season typically starts around here, September 20th, or somewhere around 1st of October. They're planting soybeans about two weeks before bow season to get those, you know, because it's been summer. Everything's dry. Everything's nasty. So they plant soybeans, try to catch a rain and get those small soybeans coming up. And the deer just absolutely hammer them. And they kind of make a kill plot or, you know, just some kind of something to get them in close. Hmm. Um, and uh, I have read a few, I want to say Bronson <laughs> and Steve did, did a study. Um, uh, comparing, you know, like a, a, a soybeans, peas to actual feed. Um, and so if, if you're into comparing costs and, and getting the most protein per dollar, um, there's a few studies out there that you can look at, or you can really just do the math yourself. If you're heavy on feeding deer, um, I would encourage you to, to do some price comparison. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'll... I think you'll find out that that growing something is is much more economical than, than absolutely feeding. than feeding, uh, yeah, and I think healthier. Oh yeah, all around, and, and well, that, you don't have that concentrated feeding in one area. You know, it's really good. And the healthier the milk is, the yeah. healthier the baby is. And I know Austin has talked about this. You know, though the health of that doe and the health of that fawn will allow that fawn to express its full genetic potential earlier if it's healthier in life. Yes. So, Heath, we had uh, Bronson Strickland was on here a year or so ago and talking about a a, a, pre, a, 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 a doe with two fawns and her oh, calorie yeah. need per day. per day just blew our mind. Would you care to just take a guess at how many calories she needs a day to nurse two fawns? I wouldn't even know where to guess at. Would it shock you if I said 20,000 calories a day? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I was going to get 10, to be honest. Bro. I couldn't imagine taking in 20,000. That is crazy. I'm not a calorie counter, but what a what a humans, <laughs> what are they supposed to eat a day? I think I'm about three or 4,000 myself. I think it's 2,000. Mm, that's, huh. that's so 10 times what a human would need? Yeah. That's, that's a lot. Well, so look, guys, we uh, we've really enjoyed having y'all on. Is, is there something else, any, anything else that you guys wanted to mention or talk about? For we, we're going to turn it over to Dudley and let him ask you a few questions. Now, uh, let, let him rip. We appreciate you guys taking some time with us and uh, letting us participate today because we learned just as much from Dudley as what you guys probably learned <laughs> from us. To be honest, yeah, he's go, he's, Dud. 
He's uh, he's a, he's fun to listen to. That's for sure. Well, at this part, do, do we have any Ask Dudleys or do we have do Are we, we have rapid any fire rapid fires? Fire? No, we talked about that when I was on the way here. He was remember? at the show. He didn't have yeah, time. Yeah, I thought rapid you said fire. you were going to try to come up with a few though. So, well, we have this segment called Rapid Fire, and it's brought to you by our friends at Springfield Armory, and we're not going to do it today. <laughs> but we do have a trivia question that. Uh, our mustachioed friend Rob is going to ask you. And look, if uh, if you get the, y'all can collaborate. If you get this question right, one of our listeners who's left us a review wins a pair of Leopold sunglasses. I thought we only had one pair. Of we those. have we have four pairs of them. Four four pairs. If y'all get it wrong. The listener wins a pallet of Game Changer soybeans. <laughs> Hold <laughs> up now. We got some orders to ship. <laughs> It'll ship from there where? Oh, okay. I don't know. I think they might want to get this one wrong. All right. Okay, so, so here we go. So the question is, the Algonquin. Who are we playing for? The Algonquin. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, we're playing yeah, for I, a guy. I, I, I'm new. I'm new here. He's okay. been on the road. Yeah. Man. Okay, so uh, this is for wildlife with a seven at the end of it. So this, the question is, the Algonquin-speaking Indians of the Ohio Valley referred to the area where the state is now as Arkansas, meaning what? Ooh. If you don't know, we'll, we'll throw out some multiple-choice questions. I do not know. Okay, here you go. Multiple choice is A, land of the wild pig, hmm. B, dismal swamp, hmm. C, the south wind, or D, flaming eagle. What North. about E, shoots ducks off water? Yeah. <laughs> or the land of the... He, he who water swats. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it may relate yeah. somewhat to your name. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and, uh, I, and, and Heath, uh, look, I can see Heath wiping sweat off his forehead right now. <laughs> uh, the, the, a pallet of game change. It's not that expensive. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I think we're going to go with A on this time. Let's see. Land Let, of Hope. Let's think about that just for one second. Uh, <laughs> okay. Heath, Read I, the, I, I'm not sure who you're getting count, count, counsel from. Read them again. That is, mm. So A, Land of the Wild Pig. B, Dismal Swamp. C, The South Wind. Or D, Flaming Eagle. Heath. I tell you, when all else fails, which one do you pick? What gets degrees? Please. Boom! There it is. The South Wind. The South Wind. Yeah, that's an odd name. It is. Can you explain that? Well, and I think in Quapaw, it's like land of the downriver people. Well, we ask about what Indian oh, yeah. tribe. It was a very specific Indian so, tribe. The Algonquins. Algonquins, my And bad. thus concludes my knowledge of <laughs> Algonquin <the Algonquins>. Indians. <laughs> I, like your, I like your tip, Rob. <laughs> Gets degrees. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wildlife 7, if you'll get in touch with us, we got a pair of uh, Leopold sunglasses for, for you. And uh, Heath. We need to. We might need to do a little preparation for this, t- this thing <laughs> next time. Uh, he just thought he was talking about beans, not indigenous people names. Well, I'm gonna tell you, and Heath, if, if, if he, boy, he knows planting. He oh, knows yeah. agriculture, and he's a good guy to have on our team to be able to ask questions to and and whatnot. But uh, and we got a fresh crop of game ch- changer beans in today, so just anybody listening to this order, they're shipping out, coming at you. Spring protein peas back here too. It's time. I'm gonna take one of these guys' tip. Get a bag of each, mix it up, do it to it. But don't spray it. You can't spray it with with uh, glyphosate if you do that. But yeah. don't <laughs> spray it. Because <laughs> you would have sprayed. I would have sprayed yeah, it. Yeah, you sure would. What happened to my peas, Bobby? <laughs> yeah. So, do we have anything else that we need to, to cover? Uh, no, nah, start thinking about deer season now. You know, get spring crops in the ground, whether you're doing clover, soybeans, spring protein peas, whatever you're doing, it's time to start start thinking about it and making those preparations and uh, make it for a, a good deer season. Yeah, you know, if you have a ferminator, that's the perfect way mm-hmm. to plant all yeah. this stuff. And, we, you know, I'm hearing a lot of guys that, like, in a club, they'll raise money and – and, get one uh, and, and then they'll share it with uh, neighboring clubs and whatnot yeah and smart. look check your local uh 
FSA and US NRCS offices, a lot of them have drills you can rent or borrow. Um, so they do. Know, That's a good tip. Lot, lots of stuff out there. You if know. you got an LS tractor. Yeah. So got, well, look, we, we really appreciate it. Heath, we always enjoy having you on. Y'all yeah. come by and see us sometime. We'll take y'all to lunch. Absolutely. Bobby's yeah, got it. Appreciate it, fellas. Thank y'all. Yeah, yeah. Lanny, we always learn something. Every time. I, I'm a big fan of these the spring and summer food plots. A hundred percent. And what I've seen and just, you know, my messing around with it, but these, if you can keep the deer kind of trained to come into an area, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. And what you, and you see these do, these pregnant does showing up, you see them drag those babies in there at the end mm-hmm. of the summer. And then, it, and then you transition that plot over into a, a, a cool season plot, and they just continue to yeah, use Yeah, and it. you got your camera in, on one corner, and you're seeing all these bachelor bucks walking around, eating your beans and stuff. It uh, it, it just gets you a lot more excited. You, you know, know, it seems in summer, too, they'll almost, you know, bed down in them. They just lay down and just wait, wake up and eat. Yeah. And they don't do that much in the fall. They do sometimes, but it's, you see it a lot in the spring. Taking care of your deer herd, it's just so important. No doubt about it. And, and fun. And, and then this That's is right. such a nutritious planning. Yeah. In, in the summertime it, and it really is and i tell you what you know like well you've got y'all both have young boys yes it's a great way to get them out there and teach them absolutely. about growing stuff absolutely it sure is all right well i'm looking around is there anything else we need to do i'm guessing we've about covered it yeah mm-hmm. just don't forget to check the show notes we're going to put lots of links to our partners but also we'll have stuff in there just additional information recipes all kinds of other stuff so make sure you're checking the show notes yeah hey proud to bag, have you back on the set there buddy Appreciate it. Yeah. Good to be here. That's <laughs> Rob McKinney, our mustachioed in the field reporter. He's developing kind of a handlebar over there. I mean, the thing's getting pretty I serious. Did, I'm, you know, do they ever change or are they just going to keep keep on this mustache I, thing? I don't know. My wife has opinions. Is it a walrus mustache? Is your, does got? your wife like the mustache? Well, she well she does. She does. It gets well, in the way, you know. So I think the reason we <laughs> I think the reason we pick on you so much, Rob, is because we like you. Oh yeah. Well, I appreciate. it. I'm glad to be here. If nobody's picking on you, you around here, you're. She in, says you're I strong. always look disappointed <laughs> all the time, though. So. <laughs> with your mustache. Yeah. <laughs> well, Richie, can you play us out with some snarky puppy? Oh my God. Oh, we, hey, got, we got some. Got, yeah. Well. All right. We turn it so, up. Why don't, you, <laughs> why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? That is not goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Richie. Thank you, Heath. We appreciate it.